I'm going to begin reading in verse 19. The Apostle Paul says, My little children, for whom I labor in birth again until Christ is formed in you, I would like to be present with you now and to change my tone, for I have doubts about you. Come down with me to verse 1 of chapter 5. Stand fast, therefore, Paul says, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with a yoke of bondage. Indeed, I, Paul, say to you that if you become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. And I testify again to every man who becomes circumcised that he is a debtor to keep the whole law. You've become estranged from Christ, you who attempt to be justified by law. You have fallen from grace. For we, through the Spirit, eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but faith working through love. You ran well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion does not come from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. I have confidence in you in the Lord that you will have no other mind, but he who troubles you will bear his judgment, whoever he is. And I, brethren, if I still preach circumcision, why do I still suffer persecution? Then the offense of the cross has ceased. I could wish that those who trouble you would even cut themselves off. For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, beware lest you be consumed by one another. I want to share with you this morning, church, about this topic, serving one another through love. Serving one another through love. Let's pray together and ask the Lord's blessing as we look into the word. And let's also take a moment just to pray for the Lord's peace in the nations of the world. Uh, what an amazing week of news. We witnessed some truly horrible things and there are such trials going on in the world. Let's reach out to the Lord this morning in prayer and just ask him for the sweep of his spirit across the nations of the world. Amen. Will you pray with me? Let's bow our hearts. Heavenly Father, we come to you in the beautiful name of Jesus that opens heaven's door and opens your throne of grace to us, Father God. And uh, Lord, as we just have witnessed events of this week, Lord, our, our hearts are, are just grieving, Father. We pray, Lord, for the comfort of your Holy Spirit, for those who have been bereaved of loved ones, Lord, in this plane crash. And we ask for your peace for people affected, Lord. And we ask for the peace of your Spirit, the wind of your Spirit to blow over Russia, Lord, and over the Ukraine today, Father God. Would you bring the peace that only comes from reconciliation through Jesus Christ. And Lord, we pray for your peace in the Middle East, Lord. We ask for the wind of your spirit to blow across Iraq and across Syria, Lord, and across Israel and across Gaza, Lord, and across that entire region, Father. Jesus said that the gospel of the kingdom would be preached in all the nations. And Lord, we pray for all these lands, Lord, and for our land as well. We say, let your kingdom come. And let your will be done, Lord, on earth as it is in heaven. Father, as we look into the word today, we thank you for your holy word. We remind you, Lord, and we remind ourselves that Jesus said the words that he speaks to us are spirit and they are life. So, Father, would you send the Holy Spirit to minister life to our hearts this morning out of the words of scripture. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. Well, we've been looking at God's letters from heaven and letting the New Testament letters grow our faith. For the last few weeks, we've been exploring Paul's letters to the uh, Paul's letter to the Galatians. We said that the Galatians were young Gentile believers living in Asia Minor. Asia Minor was a province of the Roman Empire, and it's located in what is nowadays the nation of Turkey. False religious teachers had targeted the Galatians, so Paul was challenging them to cling to the gospel and to hold on to the freedom of Jesus Christ. Pastor Glenn's been sharing with us about the blessings that we enjoy because we've been adopted into God's family. Because of our faith in Jesus, we have a family and we have a father. Because of Jesus, we have a true friend and we experience true freedom. 
We saw last week that we've been called to stand fast in the freedom of Christ and not to be entangled again with a yoke of slavery. The Lord doesn't want us to repair the yokes of bondage that the devil had laid upon our shoulders. We need to make sure that the mentality of a slave doesn't begin to worm its way back into our thinking. Now, as we move into chapter 5, we see that Paul has three important goals in the beginning of this chapter that he wants to press home to us. The first goal that he has is this. He wants to make sure that we understand the dangers of compromising the gospel. He will teach the Galatians and us that mixing anything with the cross of Christ will cause us to lose the benefit of what Jesus did for us. Last week, we talked about false teachers who were seeking to bring the Gentile believers back under Jewish law and practices. And we ended there at verse 1, which tells us to avoid going back to another form of spiritual slavery. Now, in verse 2, Paul explains the dire consequences of taking on the yoke of the law of Moses. He warns the Galatians that if they receive circumcision as these false teachers were urging them to do, Christ would profit them nothing. Not only that, but by taking circumcision, they would become obligated to serve God through Moses' law. Being circumcised, you probably know, has always been the final step in someone's conversion to Judaism. It's a ritual that means that you have agreed to take upon yourself what Jewish people call the yoke of the law. If you got circumcised, you would then be obligated to keep the entire law as, in fact, Paul notes in verse 3. So if they were circumcised, the Galatians would have to make every required sacrifice. They would have to go on every pilgrimage, and they would only be allowed from that point forward to eat kosher food. They would have to obey all of the strict laws of ceremonial purity. It would be difficult for people to even attempt that way of life without moving to the land of Israel. Paul said if they were circumcised, they would be separated from Christ, and they would in so doing, fall from grace. Now, for any Christian, the words fall from grace are frightening words. And yet Paul is really only underlining and emphasizing again what he had already said to them back in chapter 2 of the letter. He said, if there had been a way for people to become righteous by keeping the law, then Jesus died for no reason. If that's the case, Paul is saying, to now turn around and seek salvation through the law that Jesus fulfilled is a very serious matter indeed. Why would you take upon yourself that old yoke if you've already come to Jesus, the one who said, take my yoke upon you because my yoke is easy and my burden is light? Church, whenever we add to the salvation of Christ, as many people have, we are actually denying the saving power of his cross. Whenever we say that we must add something to the cross in order to be saved, we are demonstrating that we do not understand the cross. Sometimes people say things like that from ignorance, we know, but nonetheless, When we say that something besides the cross is necessary to save us, then what we are really saying is that Jesus' death was not enough to save us. That's why Paul was so alarmed, even angry, to the point of using language, if you caught it, which we find maybe even shocking and vulgar in our culture. Church, when you say you're trying to be saved by Jesus plus the law of Moses, It means you don't understand our predicament, our sin problem, the magnitude of sin. When you claim that people need to sacrifice Jesus over again and repeat the sacrifice of the cross as some do, it means you don't understand the cross. If you say you're trying to be saved by Jesus plus your good works, then you have made the cross completely pointless and meaningless. The Bible says, 
all we like sheep have gone astray. We have each turned every one of us to his own way. But the Lord has laid upon him, laid upon Jesus, the iniquity, the sins of us all. See, friends, the cross of Jesus was a sacrifice holy enough and big enough to take away all. Everybody say all. all. To take away all of our sins. It was a sacrifice so complete. It so fully satisfied the just anger that God had against sin that it never needs to be repeated, nor can it be. The cross is a statement that humbles us. The cross forces me to acknowledge that I have no power to save myself from sin. I have no power in myself to acquire, to obtain spiritual peace and forgiveness from God. I can only, the cross says, come to God by trusting in the blood that Jesus spilled. It was all by himself that Jesus Christ redeemed us from sin, from Satan, and from the curse of the law. So church, the truth of the matter is this. When you are trying to be saved by Jesus plus, you are actually minus Jesus. When you try to add to the salvation of Christ by saying it's Jesus plus something, Paul says, you're no longer living in the salvation of Christ at all. And so he delivers those truly terrifying words. If your intention is to add to the work that Jesus did upon his cross, then Jesus Christ will profit you nothing. Second goal that Paul has in this portion is to explain to us in another way exactly why the gospel is a superior way of living. He does it by showing us that it's the spirit that gives hope to us, not the flesh. He says in verses 5 and 6, For we, through the Spirit, eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but faith working through love. Paul says when you get right down to it, circumcision versus uncircumcision is not the point. Paul says those are external realities that cannot really help us to live for God in the inner man. The ESV version says it like this, that neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything. What really matters is a walk of faith, trusting God to keep us as we walk with him. It's only through the spirit, Paul says, that we are waiting for the hope of righteousness by faith. What does that mean? Paul is telling us that living by faith in God gives us a sure hope, a sure hope. And when Paul uses that language, what he means is the sure hope of eternal life. When Paul speaks that way, he is speaking about the big picture items. He's speaking about the ultimate issues of life and death. See, church, faith in Christ's death and his resurrection gives us hope that he who began a good work in us will continue to perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Faith in Christ brings us the sure hope that you and I will one day stand in the presence of the glory of God when Jesus comes for us. This is so important for us to get a hold of, friends. The unbeliever or the man who goes back to the yoke of the law, they work and they work and they work and they work in the energy of the flesh to try to give themselves a hope. But the one who is born of the Holy Spirit already possesses that hope within his heart, her heart, from the moment he's born again. And now we can simply wait for it with patience, Paul says, by faith. That powerful hope comes from the Holy Spirit. It never can come from doing works, works which give no assurance to a person's faith and works which give no peace for a guilty conscience. Paul has already shown us what doesn't work. And now the third important goal he has in this section of Scripture is to show us what does work, what will work. What is it that produces a fruitful life and a happy life? Paul says it's not keeping the law, but it is faith that is working through love. 
The NIV says it like this. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. Here, Paul is going to teach us now the purpose of the freedom that we have in Christ. He said in verse 1 that Christ set us free for freedom. In other words, Jesus set you free so that you could enjoy freedom, his freedom. You could experience it and enjoy it. We don't try to approach God any longer through keeping regulations. And yet that always raises an interesting question. It is a question that people used in order to attack Paul and to attack the gospel at that time. And you know, in fact, it's still a question that people use in order to attack the gospel today. And the question is this. If we don't need to keep the law or if we don't need regulations in order to please God, are we under no law at all? Does it mean that we can live however we want because after all, God will give us grace. Paul would say, God forbid. Paul explains our freedom in Christ two different ways. In Romans, he tells us what freedom does not mean. What freedom does not mean. He says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin so that grace may abound? Certainly not, or God forbid. It was a Hebrew expression that the scholars think he used. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Shall we sin because we're not under law but under grace? Certainly not. He goes on to say, don't you know that to whomever you present yourself as a servant, you are that person's servant, whether you present yourself to serve sin or whether you present yourself to serve to be a servant of righteousness? So the Bible then is teaching us that teaching us that grace doesn't mean that we have a license to sin. Maybe you heard about the old preacher who said, hey, you were sinning without a license anyway. <laughs> You'll get that later. But, anyway, sorry. <laughs> but listen, a person who thinks God is giving him a free pass to sin is still a slave. He doesn't really know spiritual freedom because in reality he is still a slave to his sin. Back here in Galatians 5, Paul shows us the other side of the coin. He tells us what it is that freedom does mean. In verse 13, he says, You, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only don't use your liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in this one word. Even in this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The freedom of Christ is not a political freedom. It is a power in the inner man. The Christian is not the man who has become free to sin, but the Christian is the man who, by the grace of God, has become free not to sin. The freedom of Christ is the power that God gives you now to be able to serve him out of love from the heart and not from compulsion. This is so important, church. I want you to think about this with me and get this in your heart today. The devil, one day, the devil will serve God because he has to. Because God, at some point, God will overpower him against his will. The devil has no liberty, but he will have to serve God through an external compulsion. Are you with me? The religious man serves God because he is afraid not to. The religious man, the man who doesn't understand or who doesn't experience the cross of Christ, doesn't have any liberty either. But he serves God through the internal compulsion of a guilty conscience. But the Christian... You and I, daughters and sons of God, because we are free, because we are the children of God, we can serve God acceptably and with the real fear of the Lord, which is the reverence of a little child for his Abba Father. Praise the Lord. Amen. 
Jesus said, if the Son then shall make you free, you are really free. You have freedom. You have power from God to serve him out of love. You can serve God out of gratitude and love as a willing servant, not out of compulsion. It's a miraculous thing, church, in all the universe. No angel had this power the power that you have. You have a will to offer God. You have a crown to willingly lay at his feet. You can serve him out of love. We can say in the words of the old gospel song, I will serve thee because I love thee. What a miracle. Church, you've been called to liberty. Paul says, don't use that liberty as an opportunity for the flesh to do its thing. Use your liberty to choose to serve one another in love. When you live that way, Paul says, you are fulfilling the law of God, if that's your concern, and you do his will because, as Paul says, the whole law is fulfilled in that one little line that says you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus said that everything hangs, everything is hanging, all the requirements of God is hanging on two great commandments. The first one I know we know, Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. Thank God that Jesus, through his perfect obedience, fulfilled that command for you and me. Amen? Our duty to each other is stated in the second commandment that Jesus talked about. Jesus said, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And he said, on these two commandments hang, depend all the law and the prophets. See, everyone was striving diligently to do the law. The Jews say that the law has 613 commandments. That's a lot of commandments, amen? There are 365 negative commandments. In other words, thou shalt not. Thou shalt not do this, thou shalt not do that. 365, that is somebody saying no at your heart every day of the year. 365 times. And there were 248 positive commandments. Those are the thou shalt. Thou shalt do this, thou shalt do that. And that number, 248, is how many bones and major organs they believed you had. And that shows us that we are called to serve God. They were called, they believed, to serve God by performing the law with their whole man, with their whole body. But Paul says, you want to keep those 613 commandments? Guess what? You can't. There's only one who could do it perfectly. But if you're in him, if you're in Messiah, if you're in Jesus, his spirit empowers you to fulfill the law of God because now you have power to love your brother. And when you do that, that means you're fulfilling the whole thing. Praise the Lord. See, God boiled it down for you from 613 commandments all the way down to one commandment, and then he gave you the power in your heart to be able to fulfill that one commandment of love. Amen. This is freedom, and this is spiritual power. It's power from God to live a holy life, a life that's full of his joy, that's full of his presence, that's full of his love, both as individuals and also as a congregation of saints. How do we live that life? How do we live out the faith that matters, the faith that counts, the faith that works by love? The Lord gave us a command in this passage. He said, through love, serve one another. Well, obviously there are a lot of ways to serve one another, many ways to obey that command. But in the time we have left this morning, I wanna focus on three particular ways that we can serve one another in love. And I believe that as we do some of these things, we will see ourselves and see the church growing in strength and growing in the beauty of the Lord. Three ways that Paul shows us of serving one another in love. And the first one is this, steady the saints. Steady the saints. I know, isn't that cute? Steady the saints. You're all experts now on Galatians, so you know that the Galatians were under assault. In that church, there was doctrinal confusion. False teachers were circling the flock like wolves. It was tough sledding for anybody to be in a church like that, and it would have been especially difficult for newer believers. Now, we may not have controversy today swirling around our heads like the Galatians did, 
But how many of you know, as Christians, we still have a challenge or two, amen? And we can help those who are around us grow to become mature in the Lord by making each other steady when those challenges to our faith come along. Church, one of the ways we do that is simply by reminding each other, by reminding our brothers and sisters that if you are a Christian, trouble just comes with the territory. Jesus said, didn't he, that in this world you shall have tribulation or trouble. But be of good cheer, he said, because I have overcome the world. Peter said in his first letter, he said, Beloved, don't think it's strange concerning the fiery trial that has come to try you as if some strange thing were happening to you. Now that's what Peter said. And yet as soon as trouble comes, right away we say, why is this strange thing happening to me? Steady your fellow saints. Stabilize your brothers and sisters by reminding them that weeping may endure for the night, but joy cometh in the morning. Paul told the church, hey, listen, I'm being persecuted. I'm being persecuted because I won't stop sharing the message of the cross and the freedom of the cross. Paul said, I'm being persecuted, you're being troubled. Now that translation there is a little bit tame. The word troubled means being agitated. When they use that word in politics, it meant making riots, stirring up riots against the state. Imagine that. So Paul is saying, you've got a religious riot going on in your church, and I wish those troublemakers would just go away. But you know what? In fact, they were not going away. And they never did. They bothered Paul with that doctrine for the rest of his life. Paul did not promise the Galatians that all the controversies of life were going to vanish. But he did tell them this. He said, I'm confident that you're going to make it. He said, I'm confident in you, in the Lord, that you're not going to change your mind. See, church, your pastors and your friends cannot tell you that all of your troubles are going to vanish. But we can tell you that if you hold on to Jesus and hold on to his power, you are going to make it. Amen. Tell your neighbor that. Find somebody. Look at them and say, I think you're going to make it. And you can love your brother, you can love your sister by telling them that they're going to make it. It will make them steady. Another way you can steady the saints is by helping them when there are strange voices in the air. Strange voices in the air. You know, back in the 1920s when radio was a brand new thing and they were just figuring out the technology of radio, uh, sometimes... The signals were so strong, I've read, that you didn't even need a radio to hear them. They pumped out so many hundreds of thousands of watts sometimes on a radio station that sometimes farmers could hear the signal out in the field because there was something in the air that was so strong, the signal was so strong, they could actually pick up the radio station right off the barbed wire. Imagine that. Nowadays, they probably make the poor guy pay for that, right? It's like the 1920s version of Pandora or something. So. <laughs> but Paul said there's some strange voices out there. Amen? He said in verses 7 and 8, You were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion does not come from him who called you. There are some persuasions or arguments in the air, and not all of them, church, are from God. Some of our brothers and sisters can become a little shaky, a little unsteady when they start listening to those strange voices that are in the atmosphere. Paul says that false teachings make us unsteady because they trip us up. He said false teachings hinder you. As you run. That word was a word from the Olympics. That word is an exact word picture from the Olympics. In Greek, it means if you and I are running in the Olympics, that would be a sight, amen. So if, <laughs> if you and I were running in the Olympics and you came and you cut in front of me and made me trip, that's what that word means. It also means to destroy a road. 
so that people can't use it by making potholes and things like that. What a picture Paul gives him. When we start listening to strange voices and weird doctrines, it trips us up and it makes it difficult for us to walk on the path of the Lord. I'm preaching at you here, so be alert when one of your friends comes out with some weird teaching. How many of you know that if you pick up some new doctrine and you're the first person in the history of the Christian church that ever thought of this thing, it's probably not right? Do you? <laughs> but have a heart of concern. You don't have to jump on their case and say, stay away because, you know, you're a heretic now. Be gentle like Paul was. Paul said, I'm concerned about you. So we can gently ask our friends and say, hey, do you really think that teaching is from God? Show me from the Bible. Show me from the word of God why you believe that that is really the case. See, the Apostle Jude in his little letter said that we have to contend for the faith that was once and for all delivered to the saints. Nowadays, though, we have the Internet, and uh, the Internet has made it easy for anybody to say anything and be seen by millions of people. Some of this is good, but church, half of it is crazy. Paul told the Galatians back in chapter 1 that they need to test everything. Say that, test everything against the gospel that they had already received. Paul said, even if we, Paul said, even if I come back around to you in a couple of years, even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you any other gospel than what you have received, let him be accursed. Young believers and others can become unsteady when they entertain strange voices in the air. And Paul says a familiar picture in the scripture, once a little yeast starts doing its work, in the lump of dough, it starts to grow and grow. And before you know it, you have something completely different on your hands and people get off track. But you can steady them. You can serve your brother and help them by steadying them. Lovingly serve the saints by steadying them against persuasions that do not come from the one who called us. So we serve one another in love by steadying the saints. The second way we serve one another is this. Support the saints. Support the saints. That is not Pastor Faith's dog. It only bears an interesting resemblance to Pastor Faith's dog. Paul said to serve one another in love, but along with that, down in 15, he gives the church a serious word of warning. He says, but if you bite and devour one another, beware, lest you be consumed by one another. Paul was using colorful language here to warn the church that the health of the church was at risk because of sins of the tongue, especially backbiting and criticism. When we're committed to serve one another in love and when we are laboring to bring forth a congregation of people that is full of the beauty of the Lord, we should no longer have room for any of those things. Biting and devouring, there are two Greek words that literally refer to animal attacks. They can be used in Greek to talk about cats and dogs fighting, that kind of thing. The word consume is a bit stronger and it means that you eat something and you leave nothing behind. Sharks eating a smaller fish. It was also used of fire. If you wanted to uh, express the idea that a fire burned up a house and left nothing behind. How interesting that James in his letter said the tongue is a fire. It is a world of iniquity that has been set what, on fire of hell, he said. If you use your tongue to devour your brother, you will consume him. You will burn him up, and there will be nothing left of his life. So don't bite your brother. Bless your brother. When in doubt about what to say, remember that good advice that you got from Jesus and Grandma. What did Jesus say? He said, do unto others what you would have them do unto you. And, G and uh, you know what Grandma said, right? If you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything at all. Speak words of life and blessing to people. And don't try to be, you know, sometimes you want to get your point across, so you've got to be halfway nice. 
because you got to get your point across. You may remember how that one lady greeted her friend in church one Sunday morning and said, what a pretty dress. It's too bad they didn't have it in your size. <laughs> yeah, don't do that. <laughs> don't devour, don't devour your brother. Disciple your brother. We devour others because we want to stand out ourselves. Have a heart to serve other people by bringing them along, by helping them to grow, by making them bigger instead of devouring them by minimizing them in the hearing of other people. You get me there? Don't consume your brother. Encourage your brother. When you consume your brother, there's nothing left of him. Instead of that, why don't you encourage your sister and your brother so that when they feel that they're washed up and it's all over and they're forgotten, they'll know that God's not done with them either, and neither are you. Don't worry about puffing people up. Sometimes people don't want to compliment people. I hear people say things like, well, I don't want to say that to him because I don't want to give him a big head. I don't want him to get too proud, you know. Truth of the matter is, church, most people are so starved for encouragement that they'll never get to that place. Backbiting consumes and kills so that there's nothing left, but encouragement makes dead souls come back to life, and it puts some new hope in their spirit. Serve one another in love by steadying the saints. Serve one another in love by supporting and building up the saints with your words. And finally this, we serve one another in love when we become selfless toward the saints. Selfless toward the saints. Paul said in verse 13, you brethren have been called to liberty. Only don't use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. Gratification of the flesh is self-centered. It's the opposite of serving. Serving looks at the needs of others, and it rejoices to help others. Serving rejoices when people grow. As we said before, Jesus set us free to give us power, power to serve God. And one of the ways that we serve God is by serving his children. I want to encourage you, saints, invest in the life of other people. Invest in the lives of other people. Jump into a ministry that doesn't have quite so much spotlight attached to it. Jump into a ministry that's about pushing people forward in God, a ministry that's about pulling people along and helping them to grow. God, help us that we don't use our gifts to promote ourselves, but instead to propel some people forward to the next level in the Lord. And I fear that the American church knows how to produce a lot of stars, but maybe not so many servants. One way we can fight that trend is to remind ourselves, as Paul reminds us here in a couple of places, that we are brothers. He says, you brothers have been called to liberty, so serve one another. If you had brothers growing up, then you probably know it's normal for brothers to fight a little bit, but also brothers help one another. They support one another. Brothers are supposed to stick up for each other. And that's how it's meant to be in the body of Christ. When we remind ourselves that the person next to me is a sister, is a brother, then it helps me to remember that we are a family. We should be advancing one another's cause selflessly. And that way, if we do that, we can all help each other and pull each other along and press together towards the mark of the high calling of God in Jesus Christ. One final way that we can be selfless towards the saints and serve one another. Worship team, you can return, please. We can serve one another in love by serving one another in prayer. Serving one another in prayer. Paul said that he was praying for the Galatians with great intensity. He said, my little children for whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. Paul served the Galatians unselfishly by voluntarily giving up time and rest and sleep even to cry out to God for them. And you know what? It was hard work. He compared it to travail, which is old-fashioned way of saying uh, labor in childbirth. 
in what we call travailing prayer, just as women in, with women in childbirth, there is pain and there is a determination to push until the answer comes. If you are a parent, then maybe you know what it means to agonize in prayer like that for the welfare of a child. Paul prayed that way for the Galatians because he had given birth to them spiritually. He had begotten them through the gospel. And he was concerned for them because he could see them slipping away from the grace of the Lord. He couldn't bear the thought of them being separated from God. So he said, I'm going to have to give up some of my own comfort. I'm going to have to give up my me time. I'm going to have to give up some of my own rest. And I'm going to use that time to cry out to God to intervene and do something on their behalf. That was a selfless and, I might add, a very effective way for Paul to serve his spiritual children. You may not have that kind of a strong burden in your heart for anybody at the moment, but I want to encourage you to begin. Let's say begin. Begin to sow some time to the Spirit. Sow some time to the Spirit in prayer for your brothers and sisters in Christ, for your families. You know, the family altar used to be one of the foundation stones of American life. It's what made America. Times of Bible reading and family prayer together. You might say, well, Pastor Nick, you know, we're all busy. You know, everybody's got something to do on a different night of the week. It's a miracle that we're all together at the same time. It's unrealistic with the modern schedule. You know, we can't go back to the 1950s and the days of Father Knows Best. Well... You know, Father didn't always know best, but our Heavenly Father does. And I believe that with the challenges that we face, with the challenges that young people, teenagers, and even kids, young kids are facing, the Holy Spirit is summoning us to come back to that place of prayer and begin to sow to Him, begin to sow in prayer, sow to the Spirit, and cry out, cry out to the Lord to make a change, to dramatically intervene and invade the lives of young people and others who are desperately in need of the help of God. Take up some of those old time prayer habits. Have a family altar time again where you pray on an ongoing basis for situations that need help and watch what God will do. Have a prayer list where you keep track of those needs that your brother has, that your sister has, and bring them to the Lord in prayer every day. Ask the Holy Spirit. Maybe you don't know about anybody that has a problem. Ask the Holy Spirit to lay somebody on your heart and say, Holy Spirit, who is it? Is there somebody that you might want me to pray for today? I believe that the Holy Spirit is burdened for us and what we're going through. And many times he's just waiting for somebody to speak to him and see if he can share that burden. He wants to share his burden, the burden of his heart with us in prayer for people. It's a way to bless somebody. It's a way to serve them. It's a way to love somebody that only God sees and only God can reward when you serve people that way. You know, because it's a hidden thing that gets no recognition, it's also a good sign that the love of God is at work in your life. It's a way to serve one another through love. Church, we've been given liberty in Jesus Christ. Don't use that liberty as an occasion, as an opportunity for the indulging of our flesh. Make a decision in your spirit today that you're going to make somebody steady in their faith. Make a decision that you're going to support your brothers and help them grow instead of doing any backbiting or tearing people down. And then let's have a fresh determination in our spirits that we're going to be a little more selfless towards our fellow saints. We're going to invest in the lives of our brothers and sisters, and we're going to pray for them too. Church, let's not use our freedom in a selfish manner any longer, but let's begin to serve one another through love. Come on, let's stand together and let's give praise to Jesus. Amen.